first, I'd like to um, welcome everybody to our fifth a dean's huddle. We had this uh, this idea for this little event back in the in the fall, and it's been working really well. Thanks to those who are joining, and uh, to all of those that watch it or listen to it later. So, for those that are in the room, just so you know, we tend to get a lot more people afterwards that watch or listen or podcast this. So, if you have questions and stuff at the end that you want to want to ask us, um, please do because others will appreciate that. Um, later on. So tonight we have a very special guest, which is Dr. Jason Harkins. Uh, I will introduce him. I think a lot of people know him, but just in case some of the students don't, I'll introduce him a little bit later uh, when he takes over his part of the evening. So hopefully everybody can see um, the slides there and they look good. So uh, thanks for coming. We will do two things at the end. We'll have an open Q&A. This is being recorded. Then we will also move to an in-camera uh, Q and A. So we'll stop recording. If anyone's got any questions they want to ask, and this was maybe not as relevant for tonight, but certainly if it's something that is personal in our career development workshop, for instance, we stayed on a lot longer. But Jason and I will do an open Q and A, and then there's certainly an in camera where we'll stop recording and we're willing to keep chatting afterwards if that is uh, of interest to anyone who's on tonight. So as as we said up front, this is number five. Very excited about it, and we're looking forward to digging into a couple of things. And I'm going to give a very much a, a high-level kind of background on revenue generation. And the true expert, uh, Dr. Harkins, is going to dig into uh, using teams and how we create these kind of ventures that can actually work. So we've learned from our first four and feedback from participants. We want these things to be very tactical and very, very useful. The idea behind the, the Dean's Huddle is that it's for MBAs and MBAs alum and close friends only. And so we've had very good uptake on our first four that Connor's produced and, and uh, we're hoping to continue that. So we're usually getting in the neighborhood of 100 to 200 that are checking it in some form or another, uh, either live or afterwards. So we're pretty happy about that as we go forward. So I'm gonna have a very quick update on what's happening on the Graduate School of Business and some uh, some new things, and then I'm going to get into Revenue Generation 101, so very high level, but it's one of the things we kind of wanted to, to add to what you get in, in your curriculum, and then I mentioned we'll get into to Dr. Harkin's part of the evening. So quick update, a couple of one very exciting thing. So an alum of the program, uh, he's actually a double black bear, uh, Mark Skinner and his wife, Evan, have made a donation to us to start we're very excited about this. Connor's going to help produce the first one as well, but the main MBA Academy. And the idea here, and we'll launch this about a year and a little bit from now, it's kind of a ramped up version of our capstone class that will be in person and that will hopefully start and create this thing that people really want to be a part of. So it's going to have CEOs as part of it, an in-person component, hopefully at our new, uh, our new offices at 304 Street. In Portland. And so he's very excited about it. He, in fact, came to us with this idea. And thanks to our friends at the foundation, we're able to make that go. And we'll have a GA working on it next year. Jason and I actually co advising that GA. And we're looking forward to building a really, really exceptional thing. I mentioned in a previous one that we were hiring a new recruiter to help with our numbers. So Julia Van Steenberg is joining us actually tomorrow uh, as her first day. And so we're very, very excited about that. Uh, our work is ongoing. Uh, Jason can talk about this as well to build our brand outside of Maine, really, and try to really drive our positioning of our of the Maine Business School and the Graduate School of Business and what that kind of means going forward. And since we last chatted, we've had two very positive results in terms of global rankings for the MBA by US News and CEO Magazine. So we're very pleased about those and continues to show the quality of the program and the faculty that's coming forward. There's a very quick update. So now into the topic of the evening, and I'm gonna move through quite a bit of stuff here relatively quickly, but it's to get you into the, the mindset of revenue generation and how we think about it and all the tools that are available. And then we'll slow down and, and dig in much, much deeper with our, um, our guest speaker and expecting fully that that should flow nicely together. So revenue generation, you could even sub in the term resource generation is a big part of what we deal with practically, as a lot of you know and have learned in various courses. And it's very, very simple. There's two sides of the balance sheet, right? You can bring in more money and you can reduce costs. And then when we get into the revenue generation side, there are those things that we can create immediately 
that are going to direct revenues that come in in like directly related to whatever that activity is. And we'll talk about some in a second. And those things that we build longer term, our brand, our background, our, that eventually drive revenues or resources in the longer term way. So those are the tools generally we kind of have at our availability. A couple of big business strategy terms that we like to use, and you've probably seen some of these, are revenue growth facilitators and revenue growth inhibitors. And there's a couple of examples there, but in your organization, in your environment, we certainly do this in our environment, is you want to identify those things that really provide the opportunity to bring in revenue. You can sub in the synonym or the broader term of resources if you'd like. Things like brand extensions, adding new products, looking at new customers you haven't fit before, offering products in new ways to new customers. When you think about on the growth facilitators, and then there's growth inhibitors. And there's a lot of them right there right now. You've heard this on the previous Dean's Huddle when we got into some of the challenges of COVID, finding skilled labor, the cost of skilled labor. What, you know, why wouldn't someone just buy it from Amazon or one of the other digital providers? All of these things are growth inhibitors that we want to be thinking about as well. And there's other terms and strategy. We talk about these things, leverageable assets and inherent liabilities, and there's terms. When we nail down to this revenue-specific one, those are a couple of terms that are really kind of important to keep in mind. A couple of big business concepts that we really, this is really like to kind of share, and you'll get some of this in your capstone classes, but it's around revenue pillars. So the simple idea, and I'm going to give you a, a long list shortly, and there's certainly more identifying all the places which are out there where you can potentially generate revenue or resources. And it's something we often fail to do, right? And we think about just those things we traditionally have. What other ways can we do directly or indirectly to really build dollars in? A second key thing to think about, and this is on your customer side, is this notion of cost versus price. And internally, we often, as a lot of you know, focus on our price. That's what goes into our revenue projections and what comes in. But from the customer side, there's a cost. So the overall cost that it takes, that, that they pay to get that thing. Simple example would be a new kitchen. You might spend $17,000 for the materials. So the kitchen manufacturer thinks like that. But hey, to install it with a contractor, it's going to cost you forty five, dollars right? So that kind of notion, right? A fan buys a ticket to the main Celtics basketball game for $19 but their total cost of the event is 70 with parking and beer and travel, et cetera. So thinking about those kind of pieces, we're going to get into managing money a little bit later on, but you know, right now it's crazy inflation, interests, et cetera. You can save and drive revenues a lot by using the money you have a lot better. You know that from your finance and accounting class, we'll share some of those things up or above and then building value overall. I'll give you some examples in a little bit that's going to drive revenue in the longer term. So a lot of us, you, you got to remember those longer term pathways to biggest pieces. Another one that's very common, this is, you know, Harvard business kind of language is these notions of virtuous circles and vicious circles. So you get on these revenue growth spirals and you tend to do really well. You get on these, these, these vicious circles and you tend to go down. If you use examples like so a sport, for instance, like boxing, which had was one of the top three sports in the United States in the 1960s is now probably ranked 80th in terms of revenue. And a whole bunch of factors came in, violence related to it, went off the air, lost major network deals, and it goes down. You take an Amazon on the other side. And so there's things that roll. So you want to think about these things in cyclical natures, not just specific things. I know I'm rolling very fast, but it's really much to set the tone. In the sources of resources, so where can you find them in your organization? And again, this is very from your finance and accounting kind of classes, but we often lose track of the other places we can do things, right? So capital, we often have a lot of resources we can access from equipment, real estate we own, skyrocketed in value, things we can use that are actually on those pieces from capital, not just cash. And then investment syndicates, which is something that's really rolling in many, many um, sectors and industries today. We get multiple organizations and groups behind them putting money in. Investment syndicates and any kind of investment have made a lot of money if they've done a good job in the last few years. They're willing to partner. So the whole notions of angel investors and, and venture capitalists has really evolved to those who want less control of your organization and are willing to put stuff in if you've got the ability to think about growth. So keep those in mind as you go forward. And then we mentioned, don't forget the resources, right? The non-financial side. And in some sectors, sport where I do a lot of my stuff, volunteers are really a big, big place where you can generate a lot of, uh, a lot of human resources, same in the music industry, same in not-for-profit sector, et cetera. 
infrastructure you have and all of the things that you offer from that particular piece. I said I was going to go through a few of these and I just put together a list of different things of revenue pillars. So you can imagine if you're an organization that needs to drive revenues or grow revenue and you're sitting down with your team, it's a, maybe it's an interdisciplinary team, it's maybe your marketing team, maybe it's a, a revenue generation team and you're digging in, well, there's a whole bunch of things. The first one there, first two really are obvious. Then we start building into these other things. Where can we get ancillary revenues? Are the things that we can sell from a naming right perspective? Do we have a level of customer that will purchase some level of higher you know, customership? And you've seen like a BMW do things like this. And Amazon Prime is a classic example. So how do you elevate some of these things for different levels as we go through there? If, you've, if you're a property that offers things out there, you can look at sponsorship. I'll talk about public-private partnerships in a second, which is a notion that's really evolved from what used to be contractors working with cities to build new infrastructure to a lot of other industries. Can you do merchandising? Can you get on television? What about all these new digital sources which are out there? Can you have a gamification option? Can you link into esports or gambling or fantasy? I'm gonna to go to this one first, sorry. These kind of things, you have media rights fees. If you're, on again, on the property side, we know vertical and horizontal integration uh, very, very well. I've got a couple of sport examples there, but it can be for any kind of property as you kind of move around. Are there government grants and foundations possible? Can you create, like Connor has for us, some kind of publications or videos that might lead to new resources or revenue as you go from there? Can you grow the value of your actual asset for selling or banks, et cetera? So that's just an initial list of the many things that are out there when you think about this notion of, of revenue pillars that can drive your organization. So I wanted to just use an example quickly just to show you one of these, and I'm going to give a couple afterwards, of, of the, the public-private partnership. And it's a really interesting one because, it, it, as I mentioned, it has this history with like the city of Portland working with a contractor, getting a deal to build a new bridge or a new transit way or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's where its history is, but it's really been evolved by smart, smart organizations in the future where you get a public and a private partner working together. This is one that actually has multiple public-private partnerships with General Motors involved. You say, well, what's different about this than other kind of sources of revenue? Well, for the private sector partner who's giving a lot of cash, they're, all, they're not getting the same level of return they might get from another activity, but they're getting other things. They're getting maybe a tax benefit. They're associating some kind of really positive focus. You can see the red font at the bottom there. So is it good for society? Is it good for women? Is it good for marginalized groups? Is it good for a local community? Does it help with poverty, et, et cetera? So it's got some positive connotation that can help them on their brand side, their corporate social responsibility side, they may be willing to do less. And then for the public sector partner, you get to access into these incredible resources that would be the marketing team of these organizations, the, the expertise they have, and the reach. And so this is a, a really interesting notion that's growing in, in usage across industry, this idea of doing it with a mixing of revenue benefit, but also give back that helps both organizations work well on both sides. I wanted to say a little bit about uh, managing money. And so I talked about this up front on the cost side of the ledger. And very few, even Apple, right? They have to borrow money to grow and do things, right? When you're, you're making all these, these, very few have the revenues just sitting there in the bank. Some do, but few, few are able to do it all the time. And that's also not necessarily smart, particularly in the current environment, borrowing money is extremely, extremely inexpensive and inflation can often offset that if it's a really good asset investment. So you can play with a lot of different things on that money side. And I'm gonna give an example in a few, se a few seconds of some of the different things we can do kind of on the cash side. So there's a lot of different things we can talk about. I'm gonna give a couple of quick examples and then we're gonna to get to our, our guest speaker. One thing that we talk about revenue generation at an industry level, and I love this concept, is this notion of coopetition, right? So you think about you know, Samsung and Apple and, and all their competitors that are feverishly battling all the time. You think about all the NFL clubs that are trying to win the Super Bowl. You think about Coke and Pepsi and beverage companies. At some level, they're, most levels are competing, but at other levels, they're trying to grow their industry overall because all of the competitors in an industry, the market leader, the number two, others will all benefit 
if that industry grows, if more people are using handheld phones. And you've seen the Microsofts get involved in this, the Apples get involved in this. Let's get our products into schools. Let's train young people to get used to using this technology. So this interesting notion of coopetition, where you're working to grow your industry, knowing you might lose out a little bit, but your whole pie is getting bigger, is one that I like to kind of think about. Another one is if you've got kind of venues and facilities, and this is really classic now in urban environments where organizations may own some corporate property or they may be near a rail yard and you add some condos and some retail and then what COVID has done to this, thinking about any kind of asset as a 365 day a year, 24 hour a day revenue generating machine. So how do you make sure all of your assets are being used all of the time to potentially bring in more resources going forward. So I don't know why this one came in a little bit different. Um, financing operations. So in addition to you know, bringing in your own money, there's lots of other things that, that we can use as organizations. As you know from your accounting, with retained earnings, we have dollars. We can obviously get debt. You never want to be afraid of debt. Owners and equity. And I mentioned earlier, a lot of these new syndicates and venture funds and groups that are coming together that don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day and just want to give some money. They can give you some equity in return for equity, a, a lot of cash to help drive things. Reinvesting the money you have. So not necessarily putting it into things, but real estate and then leveraging those with loans, et cetera, is something that's happening a lot. Governments and grants and donations we kind of talked about. I also wanted to kind of go through the, and I'm just going to, I was going to show this slowly, but I'll just go through it quickly. The time value of money. And you've probably heard right now in Maine and in the United States that inflation the last two months has been over 7% right? It's crazy. So if you think about a dollar in 1900, it's worth about 33 and a half dollars today, and is expected to go to about $40 by 2026. So money in hand in our current environment is just going to go up. So when you're thinking about how do we generate revenues, how do we reinvest them, you can generate a lot of useful money through either an equity investment or real estate investment or smart use of your cash going forward because it's skyrocketing in value and is forecasted to continue to skyrocket until about 2027, less than the next two years, but it's going to be the highest inflation we've seen since World War II, so what most economists are saying. So really interesting there. This one, I'm not going to spend much time on, but this is an example from my past. I worked for the Olympic bid in Toronto, and just this simple notion of exhausting all your sources. So this was just all of the different things we did to generate revenue and resources thrown on a slide. So the smart business person sits down and looks at every avenue back to that revenue pillars we talked about before. And then, you know, other things. I just didn't want to give any interpretation. This is anywhere near the, Jason can talk about much better than I can, the complexity of generating revenues. There's tons of other things out there that you can think about when you want to bring more resources into your organization. And so with that, I know that was a lot pretty quickly, but that's kind of an idea of how we want to think about this lens. And so I'm pleased to invite uh, Dr. Jason Harkins to the, uh, to the Dean's Huddle. We're pleased to have him. Uh, for those that don't know him, he's been with the University of Maine, I believe it's now for 14 years, since 2008. He holds a, um, a PhD from Oklahoma, you know, Oklahoma State from the Price School in Strategy and Entrepreneurship. I believe his MBA is from Missouri. He's got an incredible background in consulting. He's got a, had a lot of big grants. One I really like is his work with Scratchpad. He's, some of the calls we're on, he has to jump off because he's working with boards of startups to grow or dissolve and different things. So he's really got his fingers on the pulse of what's happening with startups and organizations that are going and how you really drive new things. So he's going to take the kind of general background I gave you and give us a much closer look at the successful on, on that side. So Jason, over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Norm. And, uh, and yes, it's Oklahoma, not Oklahoma State. They would, uh, right. they would probably flay you in the state for confusing the Cowboys and the Sooners, but it's all Connor, good. Can you edit that out for me, please? That would be great. And, but but it, uh, no, it, it's great to be here, and I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, and there are so many opportunities, so many things to talk about in terms of talking about a startup. But one of the things that I know is, is something that there's a, a broad batch of interest among MBA students uh, certainly has reached the, the, the level of kind of a popular level, uh, uh, kind of a popular concept of, well, what do I do 
And, and one of the things that people seem to be really interested in is joining a startup. And what's great about startups right now is not only is there a lot of money, as, uh, as Norm was just talking about, in terms of just the sheer volume of VC money that's available, venture capital money that's available to be able to fund particularly high growth, high potential startups, but there's also a lot, really been a change um, in the kind of uh, overall culture around whether or not going to work for a startup is considered to be um, a, an attractive job for an MBA student. And, and it really is, and that's great. The other thing that's great is that we know most startups that are successful are founded by teams. You know, the kind of single founder um, doesn't really work, right? I mean, it's, it's more of a myth than it is anything else. And, and so I wanted to put up there that teams are super important. So Bill Gross has this great TED talk that he did a, a few years ago, where he talks about assessing over 200 companies and looking at and identifying what are the differences between those firms that are really successful and those firms that seemed like they should have been successful, but were a complete bust. And timing is number one, right? I mean, Norm was talking about what's the value of a dollar. We could look at all these kind of Timing essentially refers to context. So when Russia goes to war with the Ukraine, like there are things happening in the world that the firm can't control, and maybe it helps you, and maybe it hurts you, and that's okay. But number two, the second most important thing is the team. And the team is really interesting because we really do want to think about how do we form effective founding teams. So I'm going to go to the next slide there. Um, so when we're talking about this, we really want to look at what is the value of a team and what's the value of an MBA on a team, right? Because it is common to think about the kind of myth of the uh, Facebook, you know, started by Mark Zuckerberg or Microsoft started by uh, by Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer. And, and you think like, ah, well, you know, these are a bunch of technologists, you know, they kind of figured it out. But we know that that's not the case. Most companies that are going to go forth and not just start, be successful and grow, they're going to overcome the inertia that exists in founding, are going to do so with some sort of uh, capacities that go beyond a strong technical founding team. And one of the things that team makes teams better than individuals and diverse teams better than homogenous teams, so essentially teams made up of people that are all like one another, is that you get a broad set of knowledge, skills, and abilities. You get different ways of thinking, and it reduces groupthink. It causes people to ask questions and probe and engage in, in really effective dialogues that form new ways of thinking and look for new solving ways to solve problems. One of the things that MBA students in particular bring that is so, so powerful to founding teams is diverse networks. One of the biggest advantages of getting your MBA, right, is that you're in these classes with people, you're working on team projects with people that are going to go off to the four corners of the earth. And if you're building relationships with them, then that network can be a really robust um, value added to a startup. And then, and then the other thing is that teams basically are signals of quality. So if you have a lot of people that are highly educated, um, all of whom could be doing lots of other things, when they're in a startup together, it's like, holy cow, you know, there's something here that I should be taking a look at. Now, there's, there's some really interesting uh, research. And uh, I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but I want to make sure you guys have time to, uh, to ask questions. So there are three major sets of research about essentially why, did, why is it valuable to include an MBA or somebody with a master's of um, uh, master's of science in finance or uh, another kind of like uh, market-oriented degree? What's the value? So the first is that having an MBA on the team increases the likelihood that you're going to be funded. It increases the likelihood of success on crowdfunding. It increases the likelihood of success that VCs will fund your company. And it increases the likelihood of success that the company will be funded in multiple rounds. And this is particularly important when the people founding the company, those startup founders whose names are, you know, become listed in ink or something like that, it's particularly important when they haven't started a company before, right? So if you get four or five great people together and they've all started five ventures, then, okay, maybe it doesn't really matter what their master's degree was in. 
when you can get four or five people together and they're really bright and they're working really hard and they got a great idea and you've got somebody with a master's of science and engineering and you got an MBA, holy cow, investors take note, right? We've also found that it's really related to growth. So having uh, people with commercial expertise on the team in their education and significant work experience on the kind of commercial side of the house rather than the technical side of the house increases the likelihood that those companies are going to have more employees. And that's a really big deal because when we're talking about these companies, whether it's going to the state to, to form a public-private partnership like Norm was talking about earlier, or it's going out for private equity, or it's going out for debt, when you can show that we're able to increase headcount, we're able to drive RevGen, right, then that becomes a thing that be builds one of those virtuous cycles. And then it also increases the likelihood that there's that kind of network diversity. So there's this great uh, article written 1970-something by Mark Granovetter about the strength of weak ties. And what he argues is the most important thing to building something like a startup is not who are the people that would jump in front of a bullet for you? But how diverse is your network of people who you can call up and say, hey, can I talk to you about a thing that I'm doing? And you might have coffee with them every quarter or something like that. You might have a chance to sit down and chat with them every once in a while at a hockey game, but you're not getting together with them every weekend. You're not watching their kids and you, they're watching yours. These are people who you have good relationships with but that are not invested. They're not family, but they're really, really powerful pieces of your network. And MBA students in particular, among all of the master's degree, do an exceptional job building these networks, maintaining these relationships, and then being able to leverage those as they're appropriate. So um, the in practice, what you bring to the table as an MBA student, a prospective MBA student, an MBA alum, is really the business background. You should be thinking about, if you're going to start a startup, partnering with people with really, really strong technical skills, whether that's building a software startup or a hardware, it's building a services business, or opening a bakery that you hope will one day take over uh, Stonewall Kitchen or something like that, right? You, But you all, they need you. What you bring is an understanding of the numbers, all of the things that Norm was talking about earlier in terms of RevGen and really understanding the both sides of the balance sheet and being able to read a P&L and make decisions. Those are really, really important. And that's a, that's a language that a lot of technical people don't really speak. You also have an understanding, no matter how deeply embedded you are in being the world's best search engine optimization expert, you understand what marketing is what it's trying to accomplish in terms of creating uh, messaging to reach your customers about what makes your thing in particular good. And so it allows you to make strategic marketing decisions and that's really important. And then it also brings managerial skills that are really important in continuing to further and develop the team. It's not to say that you're bringing into the team this amazing expertise in HR and that you don't ever need to call a lawyer. No, what we're saying is MBA students in general have been exposed to the skills that are necessary to lead in contemporary organizations, to understand how to get the best out of your people and how to be able to make decisions about what it is that the human resources that exist in a company need to do in order to make the company move to its greatest potential. So all of that is, set, with all of that said, the biggest thing, I wanna go to the next slide there, is you got to get the tech founder to prioritize your skills. I have been approached more times than I can tell you by a business student who's like, I got a great idea for this app and it's going to change everything. And my first question to them is always, well, you, do you know how to code? Nine times out of 10, the answer to that is no. Okay. So then I say, you need to go find the software engineer who can write this app that's going to change the world. And then, you know, ugh. and it may or may not go somewhere. There are a lot of opportunities for that. What's interesting is technical founders know how to code. The software engineer sits down Friday night and starts hammering something out. And what you need to get them to do is recognize as they go 
from kind of concepting something to really start to build a business instead of a product, you need to get them to pay attention to you. And the best way to do that, going back to what I mentioned about weak ties earlier, is building relationships in your network with people from a diverse set of backgrounds. And this is really important because I've done some research and I've asked founders this question, who was the first person you hired and why? And the people that I interviewed, almost all of whom were technicians, right? They started out with a technical background in web development or 3D printer making or, uh, or baking or whatever. The first person they hired, somebody who looked exactly like them. And the second person they hired, somebody who looked exactly like them. And if you can't go and build those relationships and communicate value and start those conversations early, you can't convince them that they need to, to look at you as a hire or as a co-founder, and they need you. The problem for them is, in my experience, they don't know how to evaluate whether you're any good because they don't understand what you know. So if you are building relationships, if you're engaging with them, you will find a way to communicate value, build relationship, communicate exactly how you can play a role in that organization. And, and then you can join that team. And again, it exponentially increases the likelihood of success. So I think that was uh, hopefully right about time, maybe a little long, and be happy to answer any questions uh, and engage in a dialogue around this. Thank you, Jason. That was great. Um, I, I have a couple to get us going, but I will open it up to others first who would uh, maybe like to, uh, to ask you a few questions. All right, well, they're not going to jump in. I'm going to start. So the, um, the first thing I, I thought was really, I mean, all that was very interesting, but your, your talk about network diversity was really cool. And then I, but I, this idea of diversity, so for, especially for those that maybe aren't on the call and they're going to listen later, what do you mean by the diversity of your network? Are you talking, I, I'm assuming you're not talking about DEI. I think you're talking about different skill sets and different connections in your supply chain and p connections to financiers and those that can reach your customers. So talk about what you mean by the diversity side of your network, particularly for an MBA student, a lot of them who may be looking to build their networks. Absolutely. So by diversity, you're exactly right. I mean, it could be, DEI style diversity, but that's certainly not what we're what we're primarily focused on. When we're talking about diversity here, we are talking about the plurality of people that you have uh, created relationships with that you understand that have that come to different places and are going to different places. And programs like the Main MBA are an incredible asset because you have. 40% of the, the population that is coming out of, uh, out of uh, STEM fields, and you have doctors, and you have lawyers, and you have all of these people, and you're coming together, you're participating in a class, you're engaging in a robust dialogue and training uh, series of group projects and discussion board posts and all of these different things, and then those people are going off and they're proliferating it, and especially if you're cultivating that intentionally through uh, platforms like LinkedIn, but also just by writing an email every once in a while, remember somebody's birthday and saying, hey, happy birthday, hope you had a great year or whatever it is, right? That starts to build those relationships and the, the greater the, the uh, places from which people come and the places to which they go, the more effective your uh, your network will be in helping you to overcome uh, hurdles or barriers that get into your way in a startup. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's really good. Um, a, a second one, and I'll just I'll keep going unless someone cuts me off. Second one would be the um, this notion out there that you know we can't all be entrepreneurs. And as you and I have talked about before, I mean, I tried a couple of times with some startup groups and then the people were still looking for full-time jobs and pulled away and I kind of realized that, you know, that's, I, I we don't have fully what it takes to be, you know, part of a team and be totally risk averse. So do you have any, you know, insights on our entrepreneurs born or bred, so to speak? Can you become an entrepreneur? When you're thinking about all that great stuff you talked about, putting your team together, 
Is that one of the factors or is that, is there anything there that you should be thinking about? Well, I, I mean, the, the literature certainly suggests that entrepreneurs are not born. It's not like, ah, oh, I'm Thomas Edison. There is no way I can, can run afoul of this. Entrepreneurship, as, as Babson College would teach you with its hundreds of graduates each and every year across all of its you know, many different channels, right? Certainly entrepreneurship is a teachable skill. Um, again, timing to your point, to your, to exactly your question, Norm timing. I mean, it blows up the greatest ideas because they just don't work either because of the people that are involved or something else. But that said, I think that, um, what, what's become really interesting is there is more and more acceptance of taking calculated risks and joining a company and being a, a, a co-founder uh, or participating in a meaningful way in a, in the early stages. I mean, you don't have to be on the letterhead with Mark Zuckerberg. If you're employed for six, you did real well. You did real well. So um, so you don't have to do that. But the other thing is we taught a class with the, with the law school. Um, uh, Andy Kaufman and I taught a class and, around startup and entrepreneurship law. And that whole class was coordinated around and focused on the people who work to support startup founders. So we didn't say, hey, come to this class and learn how to be a founder. What we said is, hey, come to this class and learn what it's going to take to be a meaningful consultant or advisor to a startup that you speak their language, that you understand what they're going through, that you understand it's different to be a consultant for, for startups, especially those that have raised between a half million and $5 million than it is to join McKinsey and go do consulting for GE where they have, you know, huge amounts of money and all of those things. It's just a different world. And so you can play in the startup space without having to, to kind of jump both feet in and start one of those high flying, high risk, high reward ventures. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any? Hey, Dr. Harkins, I had a quick one, uh, just listening sure. and whatnot. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much a noob when it comes to knowing about startups. My experience comes from watching the um, funny HBO show about startups. And all I learned about that show is that um, if your team isn't made up of of solid uh, components that it's going to fail um, or just be a funny TV show. So my question to you kind of off that and, and what I've learned today is um, kind of almost off your last point, but you know, what is the ideal situation? Let's say you're looking for a startup to join you. You're like, I don't have an idea, but I'd love to join somebody who has one. How does that start? Is that not the right way of looking at it? Or what would you do in that case? My recommendation would be to go play in startup land. And I mean, play kind of, you know, loosely, uh, colloquially, right? But Portland, Maine has got an amazing, thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. Bangor has got a great entrepreneurial ecosystem. Boston is one of the top five cities in the world for an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Like, and really, all of those places are incredibly inviting. If you go online, you'll find a meetup or you'll find an entrepreneurial support event. You'll find some sort of activity and you just show up, you know, buy a drink, go around, ask questions, be genuinely interested in what's going on. And when people give you the opportunity to talk about um, why you're there, just be honest, right? And I find that um, entrepreneurs are some of the most, um, they're some of the easiest people in the world to engage in a conversation. And if you show an inclination and a willingness to get in and roll up your sleeves a little bit, they'll pull you in. You know, maybe it is just for a coffee and I want to pick your brain about how to do this thing on HubSpot and maybe you can help and maybe you can't. But those types of relationships are the way in. Those networks are incredibly densely interrelated. And any any time you go in and you sit down, I mean, we have uh, in the next four months, just in the Bangor region alone, uh, at least 
I would say 10 or 12 entrepreneurship events, everything from pitches to uh, main innovation nights to virtual mentor nights, like opportunities where you could kind of just plug in and they're entirely virtual. So you could be anywhere in the state and jump in. Portland, I know, has got ha events happening at least every month uh, and, uh, and oftentimes more than once a month, depending on how you kind of want to choose to engage. So uh, people with the training and experience that MBAs have are always valued by entrepreneurs who find themselves at one point or another completely flummoxed by something like, okay, I, I genuinely don't understand. Like this investor keeps asking me to come up with a, uh, with a cap table. What the hell is a cap table, right? And you may have no idea, but I promise you, you know more can learn it more quickly than they can when it comes to saying, oh, well, that's just basically who owns how much of what equity and what are the terms? Oh, okay, great. Well, I can probably, you know, at least have a conversation with you about what it is that you're interested in. So lots of easy ways to get involved in those um, and, and really just lean in. That was great. Uh, Dr. Zhang, I think you have a question. Uh, yes. So hi, Jason, very interesting. So uh, I have a question related to the format of participating in uh, entrepreneurship. So, so for example, if uh, there are three, four co-founders and they are ready to start a startup and what's the typical format of uh, participation? So how can they decide uh, like whose responsibility it is to raise capital, whose responsibility it is to invest uh, technology, and the, how typically they decide the shares they own for the company? Well, the, the, so let's separate the two. So the responsibilities or roles, right, might, may or may not have anything to do with the kind of legal organization and who owns what. The roles and responsibilities, particularly in the early stages of these ventures, tend to be quite general. So while I might have the title CEO and, and Norm might have the title CTO, we're all going to be all hands on deck on just about everything, right? I mean, because we don't have uh, the, the luxury of a lot of specialization. So I can't say, oh, well, I just do CEO activities. And even though our customers hate our product and they can't seem to get anybody on the customer support line, like that's not my job. So, so generally in the early stages, probably all the way through 10, 12, maybe 15 employees, you're going to be pretty general. You're not going to be able to do everything with equal skill, but you're going to be pretty generally available. And then the roles and responsibilities are just kind of general guides. In terms of uh, how you would divvy up and make decisions about who owns what and what the organizational structure is, if you are planning to raise money, generally speaking, you're going to need to be a C Corp um, at some point sooner rather than later, and probably a Delaware C because that's where the, the most corporate law has been kind of settled and particularly attractive to outside investors. If you're not going to raise money, there's a couple of other options available to you, a uh, S Corp, which is a closely held corporation, or an LLC, which is a partnership between people. Um, but generally speaking, if the plan is to build the next Facebook, you're going to need to go and be a C corporation uh, in, uh, in some period of time, uh, and, and we could talk for a long time about the nuances of when you would make that decision. But, uh, and, and the ownership piece that you asked about, Angie, is, is literally uh, a negotiation. It is, it is literally a negotiation, and we are going to factor into a lot of things, how much we're bringing in terms of cash and non-cash. There's a really cool book. Um, if you want to read kind of a counterfactual um, or countercultural way of thinking about how you might do uh, resource allocation in the early stages, you could read Slicing Pie, um, which is essentially a dynamic stock split um, that adjusts essentially all the time until you raise a certain amount of money and then the pie quote unquote bakes and then it locks in who owns what percent of the of the company. It's it's certainly not the dominant way to do things, but it's a really interesting thought exercise. Tom, you're up, I think. 
So question I have is people getting into it. Um, my dad is an entrepreneur himself. He runs a construction waste business and he was always in the sector and he kind of did it as a side business. But then the other way Norm talked about was going all in as the full-time job. How many people or what's the split between, I don't want to give up my full career, so I'm going to kind of go into this and see if it works and then continue with it. And maybe they got laid off, so they got this free time or they're fed up in their industry and they decide to dive into this entrepreneur world or they've gained in my background in oil and gas, they would work for one of the big companies for 10 years, get the skill sets and go, I'm going to do this by myself because I'm smarter that, or not smarter. I can be more efficient than the big players. What's kind of the breakup in people getting into it? But I don't know that I could give you percentages. It's a great question though. Uh, what I can tell you, uh, Thomas, is that um, there are four generally accepted motivations for people to start companies. And one of them is just a pure financial gain, right? Like I'm going to go out and I'm going to make more money than I could make any place else. Uh, and that's, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, those people are going to tend to uh, leverage a side hustle and or going to have a pretty clear pathway to some sort of fairly immediate financial reward. Another one is they're motivated by family things. So they have, they desire to build a family business or they want more, uh, more opportunity to engage in the family side of their life. And so for them, they might do it because of, um, you know, they're fed up or they just, you know, they've reprioritized their life. The other two are, are really interesting. One is autonomy, right? Like some people just don't take direction well. Um, and I say that with with absolutely all of the love in my heart for people who don't take direction well, but some people really don't. And for them, there is literally nothing more frustrating than having a boss. And they will they will leave a lot of stuff on the table just to not have a boss, right? And just to be able to do the thing. And then some people do it because it's a challenge. You, because they're like, why wouldn't I do this? Like, I've got this interesting problem to solve and I want to solve it. And it doesn't really matter as long as I can kind of make enough money to uh, to afford my life. I'm going to go at it and I'm going to do it. And they do it for that kind of intrinsic motivation. So I don't know that I could give you a breakdown. I do know the side hustle thing has become easier in the last five years than it has been for the last 50 because you can side hustle so many things through the power of information technology that you would net that in the past you would have had to be in a truck driving and delivering stuff instead of just drop shipping from Amazon or you know whatever. So so I think that the side hustle is easier and there's there's really a whole culture that's built up around that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't looking for percentages and I was just looking at options the way people do it. So you nailed my question. Thank you. Great. Dr. Pank, I think you you waved your hand at us. Dr. Harkins, thank you very much, uh, Dr. O'Reilly. <clears throat> Jason, just your thoughts on this first mover advantage thing. I mean, I, just pros and cons. I mean, you know, many, many people I see, students, others, they're like, well, everything that needed to be done has been done. This space is already dense. And then the others. Just your thoughts because you have so much experience on this. Well, that's a great question, um, and uh, and I don't just say that out of uh, out of all due respect for PhD students who believe that everything has that needs to be done has been done. Either that, or nothing that has ever needed to be done has been done, and they have got a theory of everything that nobody's thought of. It's one or the other. Um, so I would say um, I think that first mover advantage is useful. However. The problem with first mover advantage in startup land is if you're not Elon Musk with Elon Musk money, if you're not um, if you're not particularly well endowed with some sort of resource base, like a really really strong patent thicket, um, which is a group of patents that essentially reinforce one another to keep others from operating in your space. If there's not something that locks in that first mover advantage. That example that Norm gave earlier, the co-optition, you really run the risk of actually creating a market that Coke is like, thank you very much. And here are my $50 billion to take this market from you. Um, and, uh, and so 
Um, Peter Thiel, who I have uh, I have a very love hate relationship with um, in some ways, but he's got a really great point that he makes in talking about this in in his book Zero to One. And what he talks about is um, that you don't want first mover advantage, you want last mover advantage. What you want to do is be the person who locks down the market, um, which may happen with a really good set of patents as the first person into the space. But you don't necessarily have to be the first person in the space to be the last person in the space, to end up being the monopoly that Facebook is, right? Because MySpace certainly predated uh, and Friendster predated Facebook, but they kind of locked down the market and now they're able to kind of run out the ramp. So I think first mover advantage is good where you can really lock it down. Uh, but many startups, they can't. I mean, it's because of money and talent and time and everything else. I mean, this would date me, but just real quick, like Michael Dell, you know, of Dell Computers, when he started from his college dorm, you had IBM and Compaq and Hewlett Packard. And he was told that, hey, you know, what's the point? Right. <laughs> yeah. But but a lot of students sometimes they're like, oh yeah, we have this great idea, but I think it's been done. You know. So so I appreciate yeah. your thoughts. Yeah. And that's a process innovation right there. And it's super powerful. If you can be the one who does does the thing that everybody else does, but you do it in a new way, like that's awesome. Thank you, Jason. That was good. And thank you for defining patent thicket for all of us when you spoke about it. I appreciated that. That was really, it's a new term in my uh, lexicon. I think we're, we're approaching 10. So unless anyone else, I have one more I'd like to ask, and then I think we'll let everyone enjoy what's left of their Sunday evening. So I think one of the things we're all picking up on, and this has been great, is, is your really your focus on the teams, right? That's been one of your themes. So I'm hoping you can answer this as a part A, that if we're a group of MBAs, and I mentioned I was in this situation that are in an enterprise that's starting to move a little bit, save a bit of money, you got a bit of traction, or we're an MBA who's maybe being asked to join this. So thinking about the team, so we're like at an early stage and you've got four or five people and you mentioned like, now you're, it's really important, investors care about who you add. So who, if you're the that group of people, who do you add? And this touched on a bit of Angie's point, how do you add it? Like, should you be giving away ownership and equity versus paying those people, you know, when cash is tight and those kind of things. And then flip side, part B, if I'm an MBA and I got a chance to join one of these up and comers, how much risk reward do I want salary? Do I take a little bit of ownership, even though that may never be worth something? Maybe you could give us a, a little bit of advice because a lot of our students might be in think, either one of those scenarios. Yeah, so, um, so generally speaking, you definitely want all of your kind of founding team and even early employees that are going to be more on the employee side than on the co-founder side. You want them to have some equity, right? It's skin in the game and it ties their economic fortunes uh, to the company, to the outcomes of the company, which is really valuable. Uh, investors like to see it. It's a really important thing. What the mix is, is somewhat of an individual difference variable, right? Depends on how much you've got in savings. Do you have a spouse that can afford to work so you don't have to be able to be paid as much salary? But generally speaking, I would say what you don't want to do is you don't want to give too much equity to somebody who you're not really sure is, uh, is motivated by the same things that your team is. So I have, for a really long time, um, encouraged entrepreneurs, uh, regardless of the type of business they're building, whether it's opening a bakery or starting uh, the next great tech startup, I've encouraged them to really engage in what I call founder dating. Um, it's a concept that I, that I got from a, a book that I read, whereby you really sit down and you vet these people and you understand who are they? What are they trying to do? What's their timeline? You know, what are their key criteria? You really have to understand that stuff. There's a bunch of technical pieces about what you would do in terms of letting them vest into equity, which essentially says, I'm going to give you 20% of the company, but not really, right? It's going to take you four years to earn 20%. You're going to end up with 5%. And only if you survive in the first, through the whole first year, will you right. get some equity, but you're going to want to give them some equity. And I would certainly say, if you're looking at joining a team, either as an early employee or as a founder, you need to make sure that you have your base needs met, right? For salary. 
you've got to be able to afford rent. You have to be able to afford food. You don't have to be able to afford to go out at a great restaurant, but you've got to be able to eat. But beyond that, equity is generally speaking the best way for you to accumulate long-term wealth. Um, if, if you're going to believe in this thing enough to stop doing something else and join this, then, uh, then the, presumably you believe that the future is bright for the venture, but the long-term wealth capture is going to be by taking ownership in the company as compared to getting paid a salary. That's terrific. Does anyone else have any last burning questions or, or Jason, if you have any final thoughts for the MBA students and then we can, I think we can wrap it up. I mean, I, I think that the thing that I would say is, you know, really take advantage of if you like startup land, whether or not it's joining a startup or it's advising startups or it's just being adjacent to the incredibly high energy that comes out of this, uh, out of this type of activity find ways to get engaged, take advantage of your networks, build those networks with authenticity and with, with interest, and, uh, and then really try and think through um, what it is that you might do to add value to others. You know, a, a kind of a giving first mentality goes a long way in this, in this space. And, uh, and you can find a lot of opportunities, um, whether they're um, serving on a board, uh, joining a founding team or just generally piling in and giving a hand and saying, Hey, I met with that guy over coffee and he asked me how to use HubSpot. And like, I was able to tell him and that was awesome. And then now look at him, he's worth $10 billion. You know, I think that there's lots of ways for you to, to really think about this. And I would encourage you uh, very genuinely to, to, uh, to look at opportunities just to get involved, um, whatever makes sense for you. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to Connor, our producer for tonight. And thank you to everyone for joining us. I think because we've got to this stage, we'll, uh, we'll do a wrap here and uh, we'll see you again, I think in about a month's time, right, Connor? Yeah, we don't have an official date yet, but we've got an exciting last uh, anchor topic for the, for the season, uh, season one, I guess you could call it. <laughs> and uh, we'll be announcing that shortly. So yeah, we're, we're all set for that. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.